fascinating life story of penicillin, the magic bullet. Nineteen twenty eight. Mold spores drift in the wind across the London rooftops. They blow in the second floor window of St. Mary's Hospital, the laboratory of Alexander Fleming. Here, we're told, occurred one of the greatest medical discoveries of all time penicillin. A fluffy white mass which increases rapidly inhibited some species of bacteria. Today, we fear cancer and heart disease. Then, it was bacterial infections, meningitis, pneumonia, tuberculosis were words of doom. When penicillin became a medicine, the world changed forever. Alexander Fleming received most of the public credit for the miracle. But Fleming's laboratory notebooks reveal that he quite quickly abandoned work on penicillin, convinced that it would never work in living tissue. Then, 12 years later, as the Second World War began, three scientists at Oxford mastered penicillin's fragile structure and produced the greatest medicine in the history of mankind. Australian Howard Florey was the youngest ever professor in the Sir William Dunn School at Oxford University. Recruits to the school were told, he's the best, but you won't like him. Through the 1930s, he combed the English universities to recruit his dream team to the Dunn School. As chemist, he chose the temperamental German Jew, Ernst Chain. A refugee from Nazi Germany, Chain proudly kept a Gestapo wanted poster on his laboratory wall. Then there was Norman Heatley. His genius was making laboratory equipment from university junk. We do not go. Volga is not a fair term. It is Volga, it is Christ. From the start, the relationship between Chain and Flory was lively. It was said the walls echoed with their shouting matches. But that came later. On the summer evenings before the war, they walked together, challenging each other's ideas and planning new directions for their research. In retrospect, the planning and unfolding of experiments uh, appear to be a beautiful and logical sequence, but we all know that the facts are that we usually stumble from one lot of dubious observations to another. Chain had discovered that the use of moulds to stop wounds becoming infected went back to ancient times. The Chinese had used mouldy soybeans, the Greeks used mouldy cheese. And in Flory's country, Australia, Aboriginals made bandages of mouldy bark taken from the shady side of trees. Chain read every research paper he could find and came across a paper published in 1929 by Alexander Fleming, which described how a mold called Penicillium natatum destroyed bacteria in laboratory tests. The subject took my interest and I could see at least uh, five years of good scientific work on these antibacterial substances. But no one had taken the next big step. It was bacteria growing inside the body that were the big killers. Could moulds be used to stop them? Chain discussed his ideas with Flory. Chain proposed, and I agreed to go along with this proposal to investigate the mould in detail. Chain found a sample of Penicillium natatum at the Dunn School. To move beyond the previous work, Chain needed to extract the active ingredient from the mould so they could inject it. I could see from Fleming's papers that he could see the potential of the mould, but he had been unable to take the work further. You know, the active substance of, of, was 
extremely unstable and difficult to isolate. By careful balancing of the acidity and using crushed ice to keep the broth cold, Chain was able to isolate the active substance. It took nearly two years, but by early 1940, Chain delivered the first tiny amount of insignificant looking yellow powder. This was penicillin. This was what killed bacteria. Now it was Flory's turn. He instructed his research assistant, James Kent, to prepare mice for the first trials on living tissue. Norman Heatley recorded the event. On May the 25th, 1940, we did an extremely crucial experiment to see if penicillin would prevent the certain death of mice experimentally infected with streptococcus, a, a disease germ. Eight mice were taken and all were given a certainly fatal dose of this organism. And four were given penicillin. As he often did, Flory filmed the experiment. If they survived, those mice would become the small stars of one of the greatest moments in science. They waited into the night to give injections of penicillin every two hours. Flory gave the final injection at 10 p.m. This is the BBC Home Service. British forces are defending a perimeter near the French town of Dunkirk. Eatley stayed on through the night to observe. They treated mice apparently very well. Controls, one nearly dead, others in a poor way. One got up and staggered about for a few seconds and fell down. As Heatley watched with mounting excitement, over the next few hours the controls, the untreated mice, began dying and the four mice injected with penicillin remained alive and well. I left the labs at 3.45 a.m. on Sunday when it was already beginning to grow light. All four control animals were dead. It really looks as if penicillin may be of practical importance. As the Sunday bells rang out over Oxford, an excited Britain woke up to the news that 300,000 British troops had escaped the German army at Dunkirk. At the Dun School, they woke to the news which would ultimately be of far greater significance. Four albino mice had survived a fatal dose of bacteria, virulent hemolytic streptococci, thanks to an injection of yellow powder. Oh, Margaret, come and see. One of the first people to hear the news from Flory was Dr. Margaret Jennings. Jennings had recently joined the team to work on bacteria. Their discreet affair would become one of the worst kept secrets in the Dunn School. They had seen a magic door of healing open a few inches but they still didn't have anything like enough penicillin to conduct experiments on humans. The question was, how to get more? Hitler now occupied Belgium, France and the Netherlands. Britain waited. Her factories worked round the clock building stocks of war supplies. It was impossible for Flory to find anyone to manufacture penicillin. His only option was to turn his university department into a clandestine mold factory. They would have to use every available warm spot in the school. Well, the work was going on on, on many fronts, but the, the yield was pathetically small. Essentially what you had to do was grow the fungus on layers of medium, about 
one and a half centimeters thick, something of that order, for 10 days at a temperature of 24 degrees centigrade. As you can imagine, we, we needed a lot of vessels uh, to do this. We, we took every kind of container we could find. Uh, they, ha they had to be sterile, otherwise the slightest infection would, would destroy the penicillin. It was a risky move for Flory, something just not done in a teaching institution. At this early stage, every step involved difficulties. The mold needed warmth to grow, but the penicillin-rich broth had to be concentrated under cold conditions. For Heatley, that meant long hours in the Dunn School cold room. On the 5th of June, the director of the Medical Research Council, Edward Mellonby, made a surprise visit. The MRC was the main source of funding for scientific research in Britain. Here was an opportunity to ask for funds for their fungus factory. But Flory was cautious. He decided they would keep Mellonby in the dark about how far they had progressed with penicillin until they had more substantial results. Mellonby was an alarming person, intolerant, dogmatic and suspicious. His views on converting a university department into a fungus factory might not be helpful to a later appeal for money. Flory was often accused of getting more than his fair share of MRC funds. There was always the fact that one could get away with being audacious you could do outrageous things and be tolerated and made allowances for because you're one of those rough colonials. The peculiar smells of fermenting mould broth wafted through the Dunn School. But in the end, Mellonby saw nothing to suggest any unusual activity for a university. Flory later asked Mellonby for £600 for research into an unspecified but promising new substance. Dear Mellonby, you told me the other day that you had to take your shirt off to meet requests from this department. It seems to me that I have acquired a reputation of being some sort of academic highway robber, what we call back home a bush ranger. This time, Mellonby gave him only 25 pounds. There's a war on, he was told. When he passed by, he had no other choice but to engage me.